Okay, so a uh, quick introduction. I've been here from SG Enable. So in SG Enable, basically, I look more into uh, assistive technology and accessibility. So it's good to see many familiar faces here. I mean, I've been talking nonstop since the day. So it's a good thing, right? Okay, so cool. So today, for this panel itself, right, we call it Disability Innovation in Action. So, well, I mean, it's, it's very easy to have an idea, but if you want to translate this idea into something very tangible, something that delivers an impact to a person with disabilities, right? To be honest, I would say it's not very easy. So on the panel here, we're very, we very happy to have, you know, have four individuals here who really made it work through their, through, through their efforts, you know, bringing an idea from conceptual to implementation and you know, hopefully with scaling as well. And any funders in the, in the, in the court? Yeah, I think they, you, you all need to find them, right? Cool. Okay, so um, I mean, Josh has already introduced briefly the names and titles, so I probably I don't uh, go into that. I want to make this a more fast paced you know, kind of thing. So without further ado, maybe I can just pass it down. So, uh, for each of you to give an uh, introduction yourself and straight away go into the presentation. How about that? Cool. Right. Okay. Over to you, Kai. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Um, yep. So I'm Kai. I'm one of the project leads for Smart BFA, Smart Mobility and Accessibility for Barrier Free Access. Um, basically, what we're building is a Google Maps for wheelchair users for accessible route recommendation. I am Denise. I'm the impact lead for Engineering Good. We're a non profit organization that aims to make technology accessible to vulnerable communities through community-based projects. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gong He from Fingerdance. We are building a sign language translation system for the deaf community. Uh, and uh, now, we, in Singapore, we are uh, doing Singapore Sign Language Contextualization. Just like you can see uh, in my left side, the two great interpreters to help us to translate our words into sign language. And what we are trying to do is to use AI to make signing everywhere. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Alex. Uh, yeah, I'm from Digital Dream. Uh, we are into, uh, one of the many things we do is into immersive technology, currently installed in 17 locations in Singapore. Uh, later on, uh, we will share with you what we do, how we do, and why we do. Thank you. As mentioned, my name's Kai. I'm one of the, one of the uh, project leads. So there's a few of us working together. Um, we are supported by SG Enable through the Enabling Lies Initiative Grant. Um, and now we work very closely together with Disabled People's Association. So the issue, um, basically for most wheelchair users, if they want to use Google Maps, um, it doesn't always give a wheelchair accessible route, right? So there have been several occasions where if I want to maybe find a crossing to a main road, it might lead me to an overhead bridge, but then this overhead bridge is not accessible, okay? So how do I now find the way across. The only way for me to do that is to wheel manually. Okay, either go right 500 meters down the road or go left 200 meters down the road, and the only way I can find a crossing is by actually wheeling there, which is quite a lot of effort. So how do we prevent this? By right, um, that route should have been recommended already, okay? and that's what we're working towards, um, accessible route recommendation. Okay? In order to do that, we need data, and a lot of data. Okay? And through the ELI grant, we basically built a data collection app to crowdsource accessibility route data. Okay? Um, so through this app, you can um, collect GPS data, which then is the routing data, as well as annotate obstacles or points of accessibility. Okay? So for example, um, throughout, from the left to right, you can see um, how you annotate uh, potential obstacles. Um, so this data will then be put into a dashboard. So right now what I'm showing is a dashboard um, of part of Singapore, okay, um, showing the CBD area. And the blue lines represent the accessible routes. And the little green and yellow circles are annotations. So these annotations are either um, barriers to accessibility, for example, uh, steep ramps or maybe potholes um, or curbs that are in the way, um, and that's the kind of data that we collect. So we do this through crowdsource methods. Basically, we get volunteers together to come and um, yeah, uh, help collect data. Initially, when we first started, um, we used to attach sensors um, to two wheelchairs, different equipment that we had, but the problem with that was scalability. We only had two wheelchairs, and to collect data of the entire of Singapore um, would have been very, very difficult. 
So through the ELI grant, what we did was basically find a method to then crowdsource that accessibility data by using a mobile app. Okay? And within the mobile app, you have different types of sensors. So you've got your GPS, you've got your altimeter, you've got your XYZ axis of, you know, is it tilt your or uh, of the angle of the road, for example, or the path. Right? And of course, you have your camera where you can then annotate different obstacles. Right? So this, what I'm showing now is another map with blue lines showing all the accessible route data that has been collected throughout Singapore. There's still a fair bit that needs to be done, um, but generally we try and focus on high traffic areas where most people live, for example, like HDB housing estates rather than, for example, landed properties. What I'm showing next is another map of Singapore with different circles and numbers on them. And these numbers represent the different annotations within an area. So if you actually zoom in, you will be able to see um, the points of, uh, of accessibility. So in this example here, um, the picture at the top shows me clicking on one of those points, and it shows a ramp. And this ramp, there's a picture on the right side that someone took that's on our database showing a steep ramp that leads directly onto a main road. So the issue here um, is that if you're not careful, um, you could potentially end up on, on a very, very busy road um, if you lose control. Uh, the bottom panel is eventually what we, um, it's still in beta, is the routing. Okay? Um, the first and last mile routing for um, accessible route, route recommendation. And then along the way, um, you can see these obstacles that potentially uh, yeah, are in the way of getting where you want to get. Okay. Um, in order to do all this, um, we try to get volunteers on board. And the way that we collect data is by using, providing wheelchairs. Okay. So um, other than purely just the technology aspect of it, we realize that it's also the education part. Okay, and then by providing wheelchairs um, to non-wheelchair users, um, the main thing that we got out of it is data reliability. Okay, we make sure that the routes that are collected have been collected using a wheelchair or a person using a wheelchair, so that you know that, okay, you're not going to go on, the, on a grass patch or cut across a main road or things like that. Right? And of course, the other advantage is then um, getting volunteers exposed to um, basically educating, providing them um, with first-hand experience of how it is. And together with Disabled People's Association, we run a lot of CSR activities now. So it's kind of a team building aspect that we threw into the mix where we reach out to corporates. We provide um, a team building initiative where they go out, um, help collect wheelchair accessibility data with their teams, and then you can make a little competition out of it. You know, who has collected more data, who's, who's traveled, um, more uh, certain, more of a distance together versus other teams. Okay, so that's the gist of what we're doing. Thank you. Okay, hey, thanks, Kai. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I mean, we first know of Smart PFA through the Anime Life Initiative grant. So I'm, I'm really glad that we know. Yes, we've gone way ahead. I mean, we're looking at the next phase and next phase, and hopefully one day we can really be a authority in terms of the gathering of the barrier-free routes around Singapore. Sorry, I'm going to be mindful of myself to slow down a bit for sign interpreter and... <laughs> Thank you. Okay, take note of that. <laughs> All right, okay, so with that, uh, I'll kind of bring out one point about the community part of things, you know, bringing in the community to support, in this case, right, our application of technology. Um, not going to dive more into this, but later we'll ask the whole panel you know, of your views on this. But before that, so let's move on to the next person first. So maybe, Dennis, you can take over from here. Cool. Thanks, Alvin. Right, so we're Engineering Good. We are a non-profit organization that makes technology accessible to vulnerable communities since 2014. So how we do this is two verticals. The first one is digital inclusion, where we provide refurbished laptops uh, to low-income communities. And the second one is assistive technology, uh, Tech for Good, which is our innovation festival. And Opening next year will be our inclusive makerspace. So today I'm going to focus on tech for good and how uh, that 
it's, we created it as a platform to bring the community closer together. Because we realize doing all these projects that many volunteer innovators, they don't have the experience with the disability community and they know very little about accessibility. So the Tech for Good program has two parts. The three-month innovation program where innovators, community partners, technical mentors, all of them come together to work on a problem statement of their choice and they create a solution for it together. Then there's a public festival where it's really a gathering of the assistive tech community. It's not just us, it's also uh, the other community innovators, assistive tech companies, even mainstream tech providers, and it's really a platform for the disability community to get connected to all these providers. So Tech for Good has really pretty good numbers over the years. You know, we have 397 youth innovators, we've worked with 110 mentors, but one of the biggest problems that we found during Tech for Good was the number of prototypes. So you can see on the screen here, it's 104 prototypes. Unfortunately, out of those 104, only 12 of them were actual solutions. And we started to make friends with people in the community and we realized that that was a big problem. The effort that they were putting into education was not reciprocated with the number of solutions. So we really had to take a good hard look at our numbers. On the screen here, you can see a graph of the beginning when in 2019 and 2021, that's our early years. 2020 is COVID, so the numbers look a bit strange there. But in the early years, you can see we've only managed to solve 6 to 12% of the problem statements that we were working on. And then later on in 2022 and 2023, we've decided to really overhaul large parts of our innovation program. And that's how we managed to get 50%, 67% of our problem statements solved. So this is how we did it. The first thing was to know our limits. There were so many problem statements that we received actually in our database shared with NG Enable. We have over 100 problem statements and, well, I think still counting there in the community, right? But we really had to be very specific and intentional with what we could do, where our strengths were. We realized that we were not good at software development. That's not our strength. Our community was more on the hardware side, 3D printing, simple electronics. And because the innovation festival only had uh, three months for the innovators to create a solution, we had to be really intentional and specific with that time frame as well. So we had to educate our community partners on what was possible for us, what kinds of technology they were asking for, and what was really realistic in our program. Yeah, but that also meant that we had to be really choosy about our innovators. So this year, we uh, have a cohort of only 30 innovators, and you can see them on the screen here. We really kind of handpicked them. We scrapped the whole uh, school sign-up system, and we really went with individuals who we interviewed one by one, got to know on a personal basis, we tried to understand their motivations behind joining the cause. We tried to understand the skill sets that they brought to the table. And then we carefully matched them with the people that they were working with, their teammates, their community partners, and even their mentors, so that they could complement uh, one another and hopefully had a better road to success. Yeah, and we also knew that Almost all of our innovators, they had very little knowledge of the disability community. Mo majority of them are from mainstream schools, so they've never even interacted with a person with disability. So we had to start right here, thanks to Elvin, Quackbin, and the Tech Able team who have been supporting to us, uh, to, with us day one. 
uh, we had to start here and introduce to them the world of assistive technology. What solutions are already out there and why don't they work for the community? And how could they adapt some of these ideas to benefit their community partners? The second thing we learned was participatory design over design thinking. Even though many of them had an engineering degree, that did not guarantee that they would solve a problem, like what most people think. So the engineers and the designers, they are not the experts. The users are the experts. The engineers and the innovators, they need to be facilitators in order for them to understand their user, help their users articulate what exactly they need from their products. So that's what we did. Thanks to Nia and Polly, we ran some participatory design workshops. And on the screen that you see here is a photo of two innovators with uh, their community partner at the Muscular Dystrophy Association Singapore, or MDAS. So they went on learning journeys with their community partners. They really got to experience and see for themselves what were the challenges that they faced. In particular for this team, Team Midas, We'll follow their story throughout the slides. Uh, they really got to understand what muscular dystrophy meant, how limited their range of mobility is, how fatigue sets in, where they needed help in order to paint or draw, where, where were the challenges. So by going down to the learning journey, they were able to visualize this much better. And that was their problem statement. How could we make drawing and painting more independent for people with muscular dystrophy? But they ghosted us after the learning journey. Unfortunately, this is a part of volunteering as well. But when we reached out to them and we tried to understand what was their barrier, the innovators' barrier, we realized that they just didn't know where to start. There was so much information from the learning journey. It was all new to them. They had no idea what they needed to do. So we got them to go back to the experts, and that's their community partners. So after the learning journeys, we had built sessions with the community partners. Initially, when we first started Tech for Good, it was one weekend, we give you some advice on design thinking, and that was that. But this year, we had six different built sessions with the community partners, mentors, innovators, all in the same room to continue the discussions, but because we knew that the process had to be as interactive as possible. They needed to meet often, they needed to brainstorm often together. So that's what they did here. They helped, uh, you can see on the photo that Tim and Saifuddin from MDAS, they really helped the innovators to prioritize their needs and to really decide on what was important to them. And by the next session, as you see in a photograph here, they already have a first prototype. So they started to put together some Lego pieces, they tried to figure out what were the movements that were important to the community partners and how they could bring it all together and visualize what their next steps were. So the third thing that we learned also was that it really takes a village to support one solution. Our innovators had to be prepared to ask for help and ask often, and we then had to build a support community where they could. So not only were they equipped with mentors and people at the makerspace at uh, National Library, but we also had technical mentors, over 30 technical advisors this year to support them with the different technologies that they would eventually face and meet. So you see on the screen here is photos of a session uh, where we had the innovators present to the uh, technical mentors and the entire Tech for Good village what exactly their final concepts were and then get advice from each other on how they can improve certain aspects of their project. And that really worked for Team Midas because they had a very huge problem. They knew the movements that their device needed to make, but they didn't know how to control it. How would a person with muscular dystrophy be able to control this machine without experiencing fatigue? And so, thankfully for them, 
Tim, their community partner, he is a huge techie himself. He connected them with the right people. He knew that there was someone who was innovating a micro light touch uh, kind of joystick, uh, actually for gaming, and he connected the two. So CJ from REC, he helped the team really understand the movements that was needed. He gave them their prototype and he even helped them code and troubleshoot some of the issues that they have in compatibility with their device. So that is really our fourth learning, that really we had to think laterally with withered technology. We weren't going to create rocket science here. We're not going to invent something completely new and blow the market out of the waters. It was important that we looked at existing technologies so that we could implement solutions in a fast and reliable manner. And also, if we, with withered technology, it was more accessible to people. As long as they had the right tools, they could modify it and build it according to their needs. So that's what Team Midas did in the end. They, instead of building an entire frame, they hacked a 3D printer. And I think all the 3D printing nerds here, they will know that 3D printers, a lot of them are open source as well, and that's how they are able to modify them. So with that, Touch to Pain was created by Team Midas, and they were able to create a solution for their community partner that was appropriate within that short amount of time. And that's our final learning that we learned is really, really important to not only receive from the open source community, but also give back. So all projects that Engineering Good works on, we aim them to be open source and continue to have this cycle of community innovators to share and create information together. Yep, so that's really our learning from these five years. I don't think the learning has stopped yet. So we are really trying to build this community that we are working on. Uh, next year, we are intending to develop four of the projects from Tech for Good this year. And we also want to continue to teach innovators, community partners, and even other people what the design and innovation process is like for the community and hopefully create more solutions. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks, Denise. So, um, yeah, I mean, Engineering Group has been a long time partner of SG Enable, so I'm glad that we have quite a lot of collaborations together. I particularly like your point about it takes a village because that's the reason why we are here in Enabling Village because we, we see there's a need to really bring in a community, right? From all the different components, you know, coming together in order to make something work, right? So we will touch more on that later. So from the village, let's go to the world, if I may say that, Kong yeah, to share more about your international experience as well through Finger Dance. Take it away, please. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. And we are Finger Dance. I'm Gong He. And just like I mentioned, the two great sign language interpreters, uh, they are helping to, to build a bridge between the deaf community and the hearing community. And what we are doing is to build an AI infrastructure for a smart and inclusive city and make signing everywhere. Sign language is nature to our deaf friends. Usually, they, uh, when they learn sign language, they will use this uh, visual-based information to understand our world. And however, they are still facing lots of communication barriers, and usually they need accessible information and services. I can give you an example, like these kind of on-site events. Not all these events have sign language interpreter. In this case, um, they have difficulty in understand and attend different events. For example, one exhibition, Digital for Life exhibition, uh, they have difficulty in attending these kind of exhibitions because they need sign language, sign language interpreters to help them to talk with the exhibitor and understand all those information on the booth. However, sign language interpreters, there's a shortage. Usually in Singapore, I think just uh, six to ten interpreters, full-time interpreters from the deaf, Singapore Association for the Deaf. And there are about 50 community sign language interpreters in Singapore. So there's a huge gap between the needs and the, the uh, interpreters. Um, and sign language is not universal. In Singapore, um, people use Singapore Sign Language. 
And in China, people use Chinese Sign Language. And in the UK, there's British Sign Language. And in America, they are using American Sign Language. There are hundreds of different sign languages all over the world. And now just about 40 countries recognize sign language as an official language. And moreover, deaf community, um, or that, like some of my deaf friends, they are facing difficulties in getting education and writing trainings on spoken language, like for example English. So sometimes text is, the, is not the best format for them to understand. So that's the reason why we always need the interpreter here. And moreover, we can imagine that if today when I'm speaking, the only thing you can see is the text, you cannot feel my motion, you cannot uh, see my body movement, you cannot uh, uh, feel my tonality. So that's the things text, can, uh, text cannot do. Text lacks tonality and emotions. And for example, if we are talking, um, for example, during our lunch time, if we have to talk in by writing, uh, it's, in, it's almost impossible. And it will take a longer time than speaking or sign language, the first language. So that's the reason why we start in 2018 to do our R&D. And till this year, we launch our product. We are building a sign language AI large models. We call it Steel Voice. Our solution can translate from speech and text to sign language, and also can translate from sign language to speech and text. In this case, our serial voice, the product, can break down communication barriers and provide accessible information. For example, for uh, any events, like on-site events, uh, we can integrate our solution plugin, maybe just next to the speech-to-text. And if our um, dear interpreters can, don't have time to join us, and our deaf friends can always access to these kind of offline events. And uh, like for online services, like for some websites, and especially for those videos only have text and uh, audios, we can add the sign language video to bring, the, bring more information uh, for our deaf friends. So that's our vision. We want to make signing everywhere with our inclusive AI infrastructure. We want to build a GPT-4 for our deaf friends. One thing, we can build a more inclusive real world. And for the digital world, we want to make it more accessible. And now what we are doing in Singapore is we are partnered with uh, SBS Transit on building a more inclusive public transportation system by harnessing uh, the AI, uh, generative AI technology. Like on the MRT stations, we can provide more accessible information for the, all deaf friends. And on an airline, we can add sign language services for the deaf commuters. And for online and on-site events, our vision is to make uh, sign language available for at each online and on-site events and make all the information and our speaking um, make it more easy to understand for our friends. And uh, certainly it's like for those media and the TV stations. In Singapore, there's an enabling master plan called Enabling Master Plan 2030. Uh, there's a one term about some uh, plan on media sector by 2030, more than 70% of the free-to-air programs should have uh, inclusive services, and all high-traffic gov government websites should, have, uh, should be accessible for everyone. So we believe that our solution will speed up the whole progress. Yeah. And the last part. Uh, and the last part, I want to um, talk back to about the AI infrastructure. We start from the sign language translation system for our deaf friends, but we, don't, but we want to do something more than sign language. Because like GPT-4 is a solution, it's an industry agnostic solution uh, and can empower every industry. And what we are doing now is to build an inclusive AI infrastructure to power each industry. And industry, each, for each industry, the deaf community will have better access. Maybe in the future, for the visually impaired person, we can add more functions to our AI infrastructure for help them to access more services. So we are finger dance. We are building an AI infrastructure for a smart and inclusive world. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Kong He. So uh, yeah, you heard the term AI. So artificial intelligence is like the flavor of the month, the year, the century, or whatever. But I think what he demonstrated is that in terms of the use of deep tech for good, I think that there's really a lot of potential. So for any, any techies out there, do consider that because I think usually what we, what we don't think is that how can we apply technology in a context 
that can actually benefit persons with disabilities. So if that haven't crossed your mind, do think about that. So other than AI, virtual reality is also another kind of deep tech that has been gaining traction. So for that, maybe I hand over to Alex to share more about your digital dream. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we want to uh, thanks XG and Neighbor for inviting us. Uh, digital dream uh, started time 2016. Uh, we are still a very new company. Uh, what, what I'd like to do is to show you a little video that we have done. And after the video, actually, I don't have to talk. It's everything there. <laughs> so please uh, show the video. I think all SPAT schools are working towards a common goal of helping our children to achieve a certain quality of life and to achieve independence and integration into the community. I think one of the key challenges that many of our students face is a very high anxiety levels when it comes to uh, different kinds of scenarios, like for example, crossing the road. So we were exploring virtual reality as one of the solutions for helping the children practice and experiment in the very safe environment first, and we came across Digital Dream. Our system allows the teachers to create the lessons in a digital space. The teachers have shared with us how it has helped them to save time in building their lesson plans in the immersive interactive mixed reality system. We are thankful to the Tote Board and SG Enable for believing in us. The Tote Board Enabling Lives Grant has provided incentive for three special needs schools to partner us in this pilot project. When we first introduced it to the kids, I think they were all very excited because they saw uh, how the games, how the interaction is no longer something that they just receive information, they can interact with the scenes, with the images. I think that is very exciting for them. So the group could try to solve puzzles together where the students choose items to put into the correct recycling bins. The schools have confirmed the benefits of using the immersive interactive mixed reality solution so they are able to solve questions faster and more accurately. Assessing their emotional state showed that they were more calm during lessons. I think the teachers saw the excitement in the students. It really brought them the awareness that, hey, how this tool can engage our students, how this tool can make learning more enriching, more engaging, and empowers the student for decision making. I think it's important to always keep a lookout to find new technologies that we can introduce to the learning space. I think the grant provides us an opportunity to understand our children better, to innovate and find new ways to help our students learn. And I think we discovered new things about our children. Some 15 years ago, the Ministry of Education did a white paper study about education and the generation. Uh, it's interesting that they discovered because the early, early exposure to technology, actually we have a big problem. More people, less attention span. People are easily distracted this time because before they learn to walk and to talk, what does a baby learn? They learn how to swipe the iPad. They don't like they just swipe. No, they don't have to ask anymore for permission. Attention span become harder and harder. This is especially so for the special needs student who can even can't sit one minute on the floor to wait for the teacher to say anything. And it is with this study and with what we begin to learn, we decided that we want to do something for this special needs. Young people who will grow up one day to be adult. Thanks to uh, and neighbor who work with us, uh, our uh, first three installations was uh, funded, co-funded by them, and today we have 17 installations. Uh, six years in the business, lost two and a half years to COVID, so we are like pretty new in our business. <laughs> okay, so where are we? So currently we are in education, not just with specialists. We begin to install them in uh, uh, preschools with uh, 
uh, kindergartens and stuff like that, we begin to also install them in healthcare, where one of the interesting things I learned in healthcare when I begin to interview uh, uh, homes, old folk homes, that actually old folks don't like to be in the home. Trust me, they run away quite often. So they actually have two warrants in each home to go and look for them every morning because they don't like to be trapped in a confined space. Our, our technology were able to bring the world into the confined space so they do not feel that they're as if they are there. If they want to go to anywhere in the world, we provide it into the space so that they can begin to enjoy the space. We also pro begin to uh, be involved in events. Uh, this year we host, uh, last year we host the uh, Squash Association International event in Singapore. In fact, it just finished last week. And next year we're going to host them again because we begin to realize that uh, rainy, rainy day when you can't go out, you still can play game in our immersive space. No loss of time, no loss of energy. Then, of course, uh, the other space that is very important to us, we call the community organization and social space. So, uh, in the pipeline again, we are beginning to talk to, uh, we call uh, community centers where uh, they are doing job with, we call uh, kids which have pop, we call them problem kids or even elder folks who cannot find uh, 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 interesting to do. So, uh, IQ, which we uh, uh, named them, the immersive series has become a very big uh, part of the community. And uh, the interesting thing is, I, like I always say, technology is perhaps not the most important thing, is the content. So we were able to create a content development uh, interface that do not need any coding. As long as you know how to do PowerPoint, you can do whatever you want to do in the IQ immersive space with all the interaction sounds and effects. So that's generally what we are. I want to show you a couple of slides of some of the installation uh, we have done. Uh, so uh, here is uh, one installation we have done for sports. Like I say, even in rainy day, don't worry. The children can still do the exercises. Next. Of course, study is very important in Singapore context, right? Everything must have a reason to do, and then it must have uh, KPIs. So study has become more fun. Study has become more interactive. Start, you, people, kids begin to connect with the lessons, not just an intellectual exercise. Next. Of course, uh, one of the important things about uh, uh, education is allowing them to explore. Today, they say information cannot be top down. If you allow the children to explore and find out information for themselves, uh, it has been proven scientifically that they retain better. They also enjoy the lesson better. Next. Of course, fun. <laughs> Everybody wants to have fun in whatever they do. Now, we installed uh, one of our uh, 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 project in the what we call Old Folks Home. I uh, you know uncle, auntie don't like to go to the gym and exercise. It's a chore. But uh, letting them play game, letting them what I call, uh, choose, in this case, fruits so that they can cook. Oh, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> uh, letting them have fun in the things that they do, actually they are more excited now to exercise without knowing that they are exercising. And of course, experiences. Many of the installations have become very exciting for our user because they, no matter what age they are, no matter what level they are, they can begin to explore and experience the thing and the content they create. So here are some of our visitors. We are very fortunate that most of our installations are graced by ministers and, of course, our ex-president. <laughs> yeah. So here are some of the... Uh, customer base that we have. Uh, many of them have come back for second and third installation, which is a testimony of how successful and effective the uh, project has been. Ah, this is important. So last year, we were privileged to be uh, one of the winners for the uh, Zero Project Award, which is the reason why you are here. <laughs> I think that's very important, uh, particularly for a company like us who actually, uh, to know that they're all over the world, there are people who are doing the things that we do. It's great to actually to sit in forums and talk to people and say, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't we talk more about it? 
And this gives us lots and lots of inspiration and, of course, encourages us to go beyond what we are doing. So with this, I'd like to share with you the next project we are doing. <laughs> the next project we are building is called AITA Empowering Life. One of the biggest things about uh, working with this sector of people is to tell them, hey, you still got a life. There are many things you can do and you can also do it differently and better. So just a snip preview of what AITA is about in the next slide. So AITA is, uh, AITA is a, a new innovation which we partner with Embody Sensing and NUS uh, to provide a series of tasks both for the leg and the hand so that they can uh, have fun, they can, uh, we call, uh, be engaged with their family so that they can, uh, what I call, uh, use it to learn and for rehabilitations and stuff like that. Now, of course, this is a new project. Uh, we've got one more year to go, so just a slick review. It cannot tell you too much. <laughs> so uh, with this, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I hope uh, if you need any more information, please, Come and approach me. I got some brochure. Otherwise, uh, come and collect a name card from me so that we can keep in touch. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Alex. And uh, congratulations on winning the Zero Project Award. Actually, a call. Oh, I think Marissa just went up. Call to it. I know the winner was here as well. But anyway, going back, so uh, I mean, again, similar to uh, Smart BFA, I mean, we also first came to dig know the Digital Dream through an Line Initiative Grant, and now they win the Zero Project Award. I think you nicely encompass the two partners here. Right, actually, and neighbor and zero project coming together, and uh, I think that we definitely see, hope to see more recognition for our local um, innovators and companies, etc. Right? Okay, I'm a bit mindful of time, so I mean, we just keep the last section to a quick one because this topic is about disability innovation in action. So I mean, there's one, one, so one, one of the questions that I'm always very keen to understand more and to learn more about is that how can we motivate the community to take action? So I think just now Dennis has already covered quite a fair bit through the, all the volunteer work through engineering good. So maybe, maybe um, can I just start from Alex backwards, one minute each, maybe just answer a quick question. How do you think, how did you, or how do you think we can actually motivate the community to take action to do tech for good? So let's keep the statement to that and then, yeah. Yeah. Ready? Follow. Yeah. So I think it is very important to uh, have organizations level that encourage people because uh, the reality is that in business, uh, it's very tough. Uh, you want to take time, you want to take effort, and it takes money to go into this area. So I think uh, organizations like SG and Able helps a lot when you have people who advocate it, who champion it, who come to you and say, hey, actually, with all that we have, you can actually do more. And also, I think it's also very exciting, uh, especially last year when we participate in Project Digital like Project, to know that we are not alone. They are a community, an international community who are also doing the same thing. And then to be able to sit down and say, hey, how the little thing that we contribute can actually help somebody along the way. Yeah. Mm, I think for my side, uh, I want to add more content about the tech part. I think technology can, be, uh, can play a really important role in this journey. Sometimes, like the AI technology, those AI infrastructure can be a key factor to speed up the progress. Yeah, for example, uh, we can invite people from different industries come to, for example, one workshop, and uh, different, pe different people with different backgrounds can contribute their own uh, industry knowledge, and we can use some AI technology to um, condense, to comprise all these uh, industry knowledge, and use technology to transfer from knowledge into some um, projects or into some products, and make this uh, happen in our community. So I think we can combine with some information, some knowledge in the front industry and the technology and to come to some good and positive impact. So one of our community partners at our Tech for Good Festival, they said in order for inclusion to happen, it starts with friendship. And it sounds so cheesy, but it's so true especially for many of us who went to mainstream school, we've never even met a person with a disability. And we can see the awkwardness in our innovators. When we put them in the same room, they even have trouble asking questions for fear of getting rejected or feeling as if they, they have said something offensive. So it really is important to break down these barriers first, social barriers, and try and understand each other. 
we recognize that the innovators are on one end of the spectrum. They are all about tech. They are, they are all very concerned about doing the next big thing in tech. But the community partners were also very embroiled in their own problems. And a lot of them didn't understand the tech that needed to happen in order for their solutions to be solved. So we really needed to try and pull them down together to talk to one another, create understanding, and hopefully make friends where they can really see each other uh, point of view and then they can start to create solutions together. And why this is really important, we feel, is because for us, we cannot do things alone. A lot of the volunteer projects, I think many of you are familiar with, they kind of die after uh, the volunteers, the original volunteers have left the project. You know, they don't continue, they become white elephants, people don't know how to maintain them. But we feel that they can continue to be maintained, they can continue to be innovated, modified, iterated, if there is a community that continues to support the, these projects. Yes. Um, yeah, it's interesting we're talking about community because initially when we first started the Smart BFA um, technology development, so basically when you apply for a grant, you budget, right? And then majority budget is, oh, data scientist, software engineer. Right? But then the lowest budget is to someone like the community manager. <laughs> but then later on, do you realize, hey, you know, we can't get the data without actually involving the community. And now we realize that how important it really is to get everyone actively involved. Like the technology is really, we realize it's less than half of it. Okay? Um, you can develop the technology, but then if no one is there to use that tech to go out and help collect that data, it, the whole development was pointless. Right? So and then later on, did we realize, okay, we really, really need to get um, the community engaged or to reach out to people that will help champion um, th this kind of initiative with you, together with you. Um, and that's something for me that was new to learn, which is community building. Um, reaching out to different organizations, reaching out to different um, champions within the community. And I say champions because um, you need people that actually drive it, meaning they're the ones that are interested in your project they're interested to volunteer, and they get their friends involved, right? And even if um, me as a project founder, like, don't really push it, they will help push it for you to get people involved. So with the way that we did it is every two weeks, you, you used to have sessions called Wheel the Ground, which was basically open sessions for people to come and volunteer. Um, we would meet at different locations, maybe one time at Topaya Amati, the next day at Novena, and then we would collect data from that area. So these are open sessions where people can come register and volunteer, and people will bring along their friends. And it's usually always these certain few people that are helping championing it for you that will bring their network with them. And then from within that network work, you have another champion that then brings their friends. And that was, and it's very, very important um, to have longevity is to get for you as a project lead to engage those champions. Because as soon as you lose them, you lose that entire pool of the rest of the volunteers. And that's something, the greatest lesson that we learned throughout um, the project when we were building it. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. So actually, I, I hear networks, I hear knowledge, I hear friendship, I hear community building. I think this very nicely sums up some of the key components I would, I would say, right, in uh, motivating a community to take action. So, um, well, these folks, four folks here, they have already done the action. So um, this is a call out to everyone in the audience here. Do consider taking action and see how can you further, uh, know, push for the use of technology for good. Sorry. So with that, please join me uh, together in thanking our panelists today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.